Well, we're going to go ahead and get uh, started into our presentation here in a moment. I just wanted to welcome everybody. I'm Greg Urban, President and CEO for the Edmonds Chamber, and uh, welcome you to our virtual luncheon. We haven't done a virtual luncheon yet, uh, but this might be our only one that we're going to have to do if, if we can stick with the, the reopening uh, that was announced out by the governor here for June 30th. I uh, wanted to uh, thank our board members, uh, our volunteers, and our members for helping the chamber to still be here. Uh, it was a very difficult last year given all of the uh, event closures and things that we had to, to, to remove, which are a big part of our funding model. Also wanted to, to do a special thanks to everybody who helped to participate and support us through an Edmonds Kind of Hero campaign last year. Uh, the outpouring of, of support and funding was uh, amazing. Uh, it's kind of nice to see when people appreciate what you do. And we're only here today because of uh, that support and through volunteers who helped us to put together that campaign and the community who stepped up to, to keep us here. So we're very eager to get back and, and do our community celebrations and continue with the efforts of supporting our community and, and our businesses. I'm going to introduce Alicia Moreno, who uh, rejoined the chamber after a, a furlough uh, in March and has been really helping to get us ramped back up and, and ready for this reopening. So, Alicia. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are very excited um, as we take baby steps into uh, our programming and uh, opening up events and stuff. So thank you for joining us. We're, we're excited to be here with all of you and to hear from Rick. Um, I am the communications and program coordinator for the chamber. So I oversee all of the big community events that we put on. Um, so uh, very excited. Um, so uh, as we get going, if you have any questions for Rick um, that we'll be able to get to at the end of our discussion, you can see on the right hand side of your screen, there's a little Q&A tab. Um, use that to put your questions in. And if you notice that someone has already put a question that you have, you can upvote it and that lets us know that multiple people have the same question. So we'll be using that at the end um, to pull questions from. So Rick, I want to thank you so much for taking time to meet us today and talk about, you know, kind of what you're seeing and what you're thinking about what traveling looks like as we're slowly crawling out of this deep, dark hole of the pandemic. Um, so yeah, what can you tell us about what you know, what you see happening and what we can expect? Yeah, slowly climbing out of this hole. That's, you know, <laughs> it feels a little bit like that. Uh, let me, I'll just give you my take on things. I'll try to answer the predictable questions in a very brief and concise way, and then look forward to going back and forth with you, Alicia, and then answering some questions from people who are attending. But um, of course, this is a terrible time for anybody in tourism. But you know, every day it occurs to me there's another industry that's just as um, harshly impacted as we are in travel. So it's uh, pretty pervasive. And, and I'm just thankful and impressed that the economy is as strong as it is, considering how many sectors are in trouble. Uh, but this has been a, a, a year of no travel. Uh, I haven't been on an airplane for more than a year. Um, 14 months ago, I had 100 European tour guides right here in my living room, and we were just euphoric. We were coming off our best year ever. We took 30,000 people around Europe on 1,500 different tours in 2019. It was our best year ever, and we were on target to have an even better year. Suddenly, uh, they all flew home from our annual summit, and uh, I'm looking out here at the Puget Sound, and it was like a tsunami came in and shut everything down. And uh, we were in denial for a while. We canceled our tours through April, through May, through the summer, for the rest of the year. And then we realized, no, this is going to be a while. Um, so we just hunkered down. Um, I've got 100 people on my payroll, and we've had no revenue for well over a year now. And we've just, um, we're just going to keep our team intact. I feel it's um, kind of a responsibility for me to keep people employed. You know, I've, I've profited off of them for 30 years. They can profit off of me for a couple of years during very difficult times. And um, uh, we've been, you know, taking, uh, you know, doing what we can to be good good citizens. We've, uh, we've got a volunteer corps. I'm paying people to work even if there's not work. So I decided, you guys, let's all volunteer for different organizations around the community. So 
as a as a team, <laughs> we're we're volunteering 400 hours a week for local food banks and Meals on Wheels and to help the city clean up the parks and uh, help man the, the thrift store for the waterfront center and all that. And, and we just are reminded that uh, a lot of people never be fortunate and privileged enough to have their name on a plane ticket and take a tour to Europe. Uh, and we got all, we're all in this together, especially during difficult times. So that's something I think is really important for all of us to, to remember. Um, as far as our business goes, you know, my mission is to inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando. Uh, we just want people to open up and get comfortable with the world. And uh, this last year, I've been busier than ever. Um, it's amazing how I, I just feel like, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm enjoying this uh, virtual opportunity to enthuse about the importance of travel all over the country without leaving my, my dining room table here. So I've been really busy. And, and our mission, I always say, our, our profit is how many perspectives do we impact? So in that regard, even though we're not we're, we're losing money uh, during this period, um, we're quite profitable. We're impacting a lot of people. Our mantra is uh, this COVID thing can derail our travel plans, but it can't derail our travel dreams. And one thing we've had to do is, I've had to do, I think, and, and really work on it is to, to keep people um, who are just travelers and frustrated, you know, uh, keep a daily dose of Europe coming your way. So we're doing all sorts of stuff in social media, and we've been doing this Monday night travel thing, which has been a lot of fun, and uh, I never dreamed it would be what it is. But every Monday, 10,000 households tune in uh, for two different shows, and I sit here and I, uh, I go through uh, whatever... Uh, we celebrated Norway's Independence Day last week. Had my friend from Oslo, Pal, on the, on on the show with me. And uh, this Monday we're going to Iran. And uh, uh, next Monday we're going to go to a, a celebration of the uh, eccentric art of Europe. And that's yeah, just a lot of fun. Um, and that keeps people going. So we try to stay in the public eye that way. People are asking when we're going to get going. Alan was just asking there when we're going to be opening our shop. Um, you know, without doing our tour program, we're just we're nothing. I, I I'm not. I, I just have to be patient and wait till we can get our tour program ramped back up. We are, I've got a hundred people telecommuting now and I, I was never in favor of, t of remote work. I really wanted our people to be together, but I've become a, a believer in the doability, the efficiency, the, the, the smartness of having a hybrid ultimately between working at our regular, you know, in-person stations and working at home. Our, our tech staff got us up and running from a, remote work point of view in a space of two weeks when we saw this pandemic coming. And, and I'm very thankful for how well we've been able to use this technology in the last year. Um, but, um, you know, we've, all, we've been off to a slow start. People always, I get on these panels and people tell me, what, when are, how are you going to go to Europe? And I heard Cyprus is open and Greece is open and Iceland's open. And I don't care. I don't, you know, they, you know, they they just opened the Louvre or something. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm being very patient. I think Patience is not an American forte. It's certainly not a Rick Steves forte, but lately patience is my middle name. It's just take a breath. There's more to life than increasing at speed. Let's just beat this pandemic and let's travel when all of Europe is open and reliably open. So so I'm not going to be the first out of the gate. And when that's going to happen is really a matter of, I think, how the vaccinations go. And we're off to a rocky start in the United States. We're off to a terrible start in Europe. Uh, but now we're getting it together. Uh, we've got a government that believes in science. Uh, we've got uh, this wonderful, I mean, amazing vaccine to me. Um, and uh, it's just a, um, an education and a get this everybody on board uh, program to get us to herd immunity so we can travel again. And the same thing's going on in Europe. Europe's having some very frustrating times, but it's getting its act together to get. So we're on a glide path to normalcy and with a bump in the road, it slows us. And that puts my business back a couple more months. You know, four months ago, it was reasonable to hope that we would be doing tours this fall. Now, I do not think we're going to be doing tours this fall, but in about a week, we're going to open up our tour program. I think we have 20,000 people's names on our list wanting to go on tours. Uh, we had to send back 24,000 deposits when the COVID hit last year uh, for people who had booked for last year's tours. Uh, of course, didn't do any of them. Uh, but uh, in a couple of weeks or a week, we're going to open the floodgates and we're going to be taking bookings and taking deposits. That's a big deal. Um, starting in February of 2022. I think that's a reasonable approach. We're holding off on decisions for the fall of 2021. I'm not enthusiastic about it. I don't want to rush out there, but I'm pretty confident we'll be doing tours early in 2022. Um, a lot of people are stressed out by the vaccine passport. And uh, everywhere I go, I just say, 
Here's my passport. When I was a kid, I always had this yellow international certificate of vaccination in my passport. I couldn't go to Germany without this. I couldn't go to Spain without this. It said I had my shots. This particular yellow international certificate of vaccination is uh, two years old. I got it to go to Ethiopia. So people without passports, you know, they're kind of waking out that, oh, I don't want a vaccine passport. People who are used to having passports, I think, understand that a country reasonably wants to know who they're letting in. When a country has health standards, it's not to protect the people who are visiting, it's to protect the people who live there from people who want to visit. And they want to know for sure that we've got our vaccination. So uh, Congressman Rick Larson just called me uh, a while ago and was uh, reminding me and asking me for advice and or my take on things and so on, and reminding me that in the government right now, they're working very hard to figure out a plan. They just don't have a single answer to this, and that's what they're going to work on. But um, with our tour program, People are asking me, are you going to require a vaccine? I'd like to. I would like to say on a Rick Steves tour bus, the guide, the driver, and all the tour members have their vaccination. I don't know if that's legal. I don't know if that's doable. Uh, but we're certainly going to encourage it. But I think that uh, the question will be moot because the European Union will require it. And I don't think we'll get to go to Europe um, in the near future without having uh, uh, proof that we have been vaccinated. People are asking, what's tourism going to be like? I think it's going to be essentially the same. Uh, I don't think there's going to be, it, it'll take a while to get there, but we're still going to be kissing each other on the cheeks and crowding into the piazzas and licking our gelato and going into the pubs and clinking glasses with people who really believe that strangers are just friends who've yet to meet. Um, you know, people, it, social distancing and, and Rick Steves travel have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> and I don't go all the way to Amsterdam to eat in a bubble, so I'm not going to get somebody's germs. I feel, you know, just going out to eat in Edmonds, I, I want to go to the restaurants, but I, I, want to, I want to have a nice meal where I'm totally relaxed. And if I'm nervous about a virus, I can't be totally relaxed. So I, I shiver outside rather than eating indoors. Now I'm eating indoors. I'm getting more relaxed. And that's that progression that we're going to see with travel also. Uh, the thing that concerns me is you got to pack the house. You know, I can think of Joe at the, at the ECA and I can think of people who are in their dance classes or in the boys and girls club or in the in the choir or whatever you got to pack the house you got to pack the plane the hotel the restaurant the tour bus if you're going to have a good value it's kind of just simple arithmetic uh, if, if you want a good product you got to pay your staff well you got to invest in what what is required to make that product uh, you've got to offer it at a good price and you've got to have money left over for profit now if i've got 20 people on a tour bus i can't make any profit uh, if I've got uh, 28 people on a tour bus, I can be very profitable. It's fill rate. So, uh, and I would imagine restaurants and hotels are the same and the airplanes are the same way. So we got to get to that point where we can, you know, pack the house and then we'll have our theaters booming. We'll have our ECA booming and we'll have our local um, cinema going and so on. Um, my big concern is that the little moms and pops will not be standing. I was uh, just walking around Edmonds at the beginning of COVID, and it really, really troubled me that um, little businesses are in an existential problem, and uh, they still have to pay their rent. And they agreed to pay rent to a community that was thriving from a business point of view. And suddenly, there's no business there, and they still have to pay the same rent. I mean, I know it's tough for landlords, but I don't want little businesses to be suffocated by this pandemic. And thank goodness we've got government help. Thank goodness we've got citizens that patronize in a way, consume in a way where they believe they can shape their future. Because I live here in Edmonds uh, for a lot of good reasons. And one of those is that we have all of these wonderful little creative adventures, these mom and pops, shops, uh, restaurants, and so on. And um, if they get lost, and all we have is uh, big box stores and quick delivery on our doorstep and mass produced chain restaurants in every uh, strip mall, um, we've really lost something. And if there's something I love about Europe, it's the fact that it's not a bunch of chain restaurants and strip malls, but it is this wonderful coral reef of creativity from a business and a community uh, environment point of view. So that's my hope. And um, I know we're keeping tabs on it in, in Europe and there's a lot of small businesses that won't be standing. When we finally do get to go back to Europe, one of the first things I'm going to do is bring all of my co-authors and researchers together in Europe, and it's going to be all hands on deck. We're not going to research our guidebooks before we're done with COVID. 
So if we research today, we, it'd be wasted time. We have to research when we, we know we're past COVID, and then we've got to clean out all the debris of little businesses that are no longer with us, and then have an accurate guidebook going forward. From a guidebook point of view, if you're going to travel in 2021 or 2022, you'll be using a guidebook that was accurate at best in 2019. And there's been a lot of changes since then. And you'll just have to know that the guidebook's far better than nothing at all. But there'll be a lot of businesses that aren't open or are at least temporarily closed because of COVID. And you got to be flexible. Anybody who says they've got an up-to-date guidebook post-COVID won't have the possibility of having that guidebook in their hand until late 2022. So what we're going to do is once spring hits in 2022, we're going to just fast track the updating and the and the cleaning up of all of our 50 guidebooks that cover all of Europe. And then we've got a very, very demanding schedule to get them into the bookstores as soon as possible. But realistically, you won't have a good post-COVID guidebook until 2023. As far as our tours go, how will they be different? Um, Originally, I was going to have smaller groups, but then I realized if I have smaller groups, I'm either not going to make any money or I'm going to have to charge more, and I don't want to do either of those things. So we're keeping our already small group sizes between 24 and 28, and there's no rationale for having a smaller group if we have this herd immunity and if we're all vaccinated. Of course, any tour company is going to go first class now in, in health concerns and safety and hygiene and that sort of thing. And uh, what we have to do as consumers and as producers of organized travel is to demand more flexibility for consumers when it comes to deposits. Uh, I think tour companies like me should have to be more flexible with our deposits because it's hard to know in four months what the reality is going to be. And no consumer should have to lose their money if they put a deposit on a tour and suddenly it becomes dangerous to travel there. That should be the responsibility and the loss of the tour company. So that's what we're going to be kind of taking the lead in doing. Um, so that's kind of our situation. Uh, I know that when we come out of this COVID time, travel is going to be more important than ever because uh, this is the first of a new kind of challenge to all of us. And these are the challenges of the future, I believe, are going to not be, they're going to be impervious to conventional weaponry and defense. I mean, defense is kind of silly when you think that we're spending $700 billion a year on military hardware and a virus can take us down. Uh, you know, uh, we're, the, the, the challenges of the future are going to be blind to our military defenses and they're going to be blind to walls. They're going to leap right over walls. And what we need to do is have good governance. This is just my opinion. <laughs> good governance. We have to embrace science and we're going to have to work with the family of nations. That's really important. There's no more American first. You can't win, lose. It's got to be win, win. If we beat the pandemic here and it's raging south of the border, we haven't beaten the pandemic. It can blow right back on us. So I think there's a corona bonus hiding in here. And when you come out of this, if we're a thoughtful society, we're going to know that we need to have, we need to be aware of the injustice and the, and the gap in our society between the privileged and the less privileged. Uh, we're going to have to be aware of the importance of good governance uh, and be mindful of the fragility of our environment and to be ready for the next uh, crisis like that. We can do it. We're smart enough to do it, but it's going to take a little more discipline than sometimes we show. Um, you know, a lot of people... They think, oh, this is so terrible. We've had two years where we can't do anything. But um, I'm 66 years old now. And this is the first bump in the road I've had in all my life. My grandpa was born in the year 1900. When he was 14 years old, he had World War I. When he was 19 years old, he had the great flu pandemic. When he was 29 years old and ready to throttle up with his career, he had the Great uh, Depression. When he was 39 years old, he had Hitler and World War II and the Holocaust. Finally, when he's 50 years old, we get a sort of a stability where you can build on that from our what we're going to do with our lives point of view. So we can handle this uh, little time, and I think we can do it taking care of our neighbors. So, uh, Alicia, that's my my take on where we're at with all of this and and how I'm doing in my business. I'm I'm thankful I've still got my team together. This is critical for us. When COVID hit, we had one last meeting, and it was outdoors in behind what we call Bookhouse on on Fourth uh, Avenue, all gathered around in the backyard there with that white picket fence. A uh, hundred of us, and we didn't know what was coming down on us. And we said, okay, let's take care of ourselves. Let's take care of our neighbors. Let's stay healthy. Let's stay sane. Uh, and uh, we'll work from home. And that's what we're doing now. And uh, I'm very, very uh, confident and hopeful and positive that uh, in a few months, we'll be looking back on this thing. And uh, it, it will be something we've learned from. And we will uh, eventually get back to normalcy in tourism, in travel, and uh, as a community in general. 
Awesome. Thank you, Rick. That's, uh, it's inspiring. It's, you know, just, we have patience, right? Keep being safe. Do what we can. Don't hesitate. Yeah. Vaccinate. Uh, Don't hesitate. I've got, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a, a little a public service uh, video clip that I play all every chance I can, and it's on Facebook and everything. And it's uh, 28 needles in 90 seconds, and it's just people getting a shot. They're holding their passport, and they're wearing our Keep On Traveling t-shirt. We sold 2,000 of these things, and all over the country, people are wearing their Keep On Traveling t-shirt, okay. holding their passport, and getting their vaccination. And I remind people, when I got my vaccination, it, I had joy. But it wasn't a selfish joy. It was a societal joy. All my endorphins were doing flip-flops because I was part of a society that was working together thoughtfully so that we can beat this uh, virus. And uh, I think we're going to do it. Totally. So, you know, being the Edmonds Chamber of Commerce, we're always thinking about Edmonds businesses um, and kind of what's, you know, what's going on locally um, and kind of thinking of, you know, how... Coming, coming out of this deep, dark hole, and as we start seeing uh, tourism pick up, you know, Edmonds does um, gather tourists. We, we have a, a pretty good group of folks that come in to do shopping, to, you know, for the arts, for, for everything, all the awesome things that Edmonds has to offer. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of thinking of places that you've been around Europe and how they have maybe done really well in um, kind of garnering those those tourists. Do you have any recommendations for local Edmonds businesses or people who are, you know, doing staycations in the area yeah. um, for how to kind of best um, utilize the the up and coming tourism? Well, I think there's a as we can see by the enthusiasm from our Fourth of July announcement. You know, oh, we're gonna have. I'm gonna be there. I'm I'm ready to sing Yankee Doodle Dandy like never before. I've not been home for the 4th of July before COVID for 30 years. And it's gonna be so fun. And I think that reminds me there's a, you know, from our point of view as a travel business, when you hit something like this or 9-11 or some volcano or terrorist activity or whatever, uh, the demand does not dissipate. It just gets backed up and then it springs forward. And right now my publisher sells a lot of road tripping books for the United States and a lot of Rick Steves travel books to Europe. Normally Rick Steves is uh, helping out to help the other guys uh, you know, do well. But right now we're doing nothing. And it is the road tripping books that are keeping my publisher in the black. Uh, so people are road tripping. And uh, I think that especially before people can go farther afield, uh, the French are going to the French Riviera. The Romans are going to the hill towns of Tuscany. And I think it's the Americans that are going to be visiting charming places they've always wanted to go to. And uh, Edmonds has an opportunity here. You know, you can go to La Conner. Uh, or, or you can go to Edmonds. It's kind of an interesting choice. Uh, and, you know, we could. I think it's a, a good time to, to let people know what we have here, for sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, you've kind of answered my other questions in, in what you were talking about, um, which is also, I'm sure I'm not the first person who had those questions <laughs> for, for what you're seeing and what you're thinking. Hmm. Um, so I'll go ahead and start looking at the Q&As here. Um, so let's see, from Carl Zapora, what are your thoughts about the number of European tour guides you will be able to bring back? How many have left the field? Yeah, Carl, that's a very good question. And, you know, I'm keeping my staff together. and That's 100 people. And, you know, we've tightened our sales. We're, we're working at between three and four days a week. And we're still having our health care and everything. Um, uh, but, you know, there's just not that much to do for 100 people when we can't do our tours and we can't update our guidebooks. But we're still making our TV shows and we're still making our radio. Um, Carl was asking about the guides in Europe. They're, they're self-employed um, independent contractors. And I can't help them. The best thing I can do for them is to do whatever I can to keep my team alive um, and then be sure to give them employment once we come out of COVID. The one thing I am doing is I've created something called the Rick Steves Guides Marketplace. And it's, uh, we have a landing page at ricksteves.com that normally sells tours. We don't have any tours to sell. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm um, coordinating all the creative things my guides are doing in Europe to virtually keep teaching and make a little money and keep people traveling and learning about culture. And we are a marketplace where people can designed to connect the guides who have to teach because that's in their DNA and the, tour the travel lovers who love Europe and want to go cooking school in France and language lessons in Italy and dancing in Scotland, you know, that that's where we bring them together. So we're just doing that for 
as a service to keep our guides busy and help our travelers um, scratch their travel bug bites. Um, and it's a real fun thing to check out. I mean, they're doing all sorts of creative things in a way of virtual lessons, as I mentioned, language and cooking and art and virtual tours. We're all getting skills that we wouldn't have had otherwise that will be valuable for us coming out of COVID. Uh, but a lot of guides are going to back to different occupations. You know, in good times, it's a wonderful gig. In bad times, it's kind of discouraging. And we don't know how much demand there's going to be for guides coming out of this. I'm hoping to throttle back up and basically be um, pedal to the metal and needing all my guides. But, you know, that's, I don't know if we're going to or not. So it's not a good time for guides. Um, I'm encouraging always travelers to hire local guides when they do go for not much more than taking a tour. Two people can hire a local private guide to meet them at their hotel and be their own private tour. And that's a beautiful way to do it. When I was in Cuba with my family, we had our own private guide for the first four days of our eight-day vacation. And it was the best, the best investment I could have made because we really had our friend, our translator, our, our, our shield, our negotiator, our historian, our our, our, our comedian, all right there. And it was uh, really beautiful. That's cool. Yeah, I've had a similar experience with hiring local guides and they can, you know, kind of get you in places that otherwise might be an uncomfortable or unsafe place for yeah. uh, oh, foreigners yeah. to be wandering. It took me a long time to learn that. I, I just, that's, if I have a regret in my career, it took me 15 or 20 years to realize, hey, I can afford a private guide for, you know, and now I have two guides a day. I have one in the morning for four hours and one in the evening for four hours, and I'm just picking their brain all day long. And it makes my time three times as productive. And it all comes across in my guidebooks and tours and TV shows. So a guide is a good investment. And I just like guides. I was just, uh, guides love to teach. You just, when I meet a good guide, they have to teach. Um, I asked, I'm doing this Monday night travel. And I hesitated to ask my European guides if they would join us because they'd love to join us, but it's three o'clock in the morning for them. And it's uh, three hours of work. And uh, I, I, I sent an email to six guides and all of them said, sure, I'm there. Just last, last uh, Monday, Paul Johansson from Oslo had just finished celebrating May 17 in Norway, their 4th of July. And he had been partying all day with his friends, I'm sure. And then he wakes up and dresses up in his Norwegian outfit, you know, and he's on TV with us, our you know, virtual on the on the uh, Monday night travel thing. And uh, he was just, I could tell he's a guide. He had the opportunity to share his culture and he jumped at it. And I'm just inspired by that kind of passion. That's awesome. So a follow-up question. Um, what is the best way to find a private guide? That's a good question. <clears throat> there are, um, there's a company called Guides by, Guides by Locals. And it's good. I've used them a couple of times, but it's, complicated and they kind of disguise their price. And I would like it just to be a straight price. It's $300 for half a day, $400 for a full day. You know, I'll meet you at the hotel, boom. And uh, it's just hard to get that kind of directness. That's what I require of my private guides that I recommend in my guidebooks. So when I go to Europe, as I mentioned, I'm always using guides. I probably use 50 or 60 guides a year. And um, a lot of them new ones, so I can get to know them. And if they're any good, if they're good, I put them in my book. So if you're going to a place that I've written a book, you can find the email of the guide and simply send them an email. They're, they're just hard work and independent contractors, and they've got a calendar they got to fill up, and they'd love to meet you at your hotel. Also, remember, I'm not big into TripAdvisor from a, this crowdsourcing kind of stuff for eating and, and sleeping, but I'm really appreciative of it for things to do. There's three categories in TripAdvisor eating, sleeping, and things to do. Look at things to do. Anybody trying who's got things to do that sell they sell to tourists, they're, they're invisible if they're not in that list these days. You've got to play ball with TripAdvisor and sites like that. And if I go to Salzburg, there's 100 little companies, and most of them are little mom and pops or just single, creative, hardworking people that are doing tours and or experiences. And um, they, they present themselves like a big business, but they're, they're really not. They're just a private guide looking for work with a fancy name. Uh, you know, study them up, uh, send them an email, see what they got, and then you'll find good guides in TripAdvisor. If anybody's a guide, they're probably listed in TripAdvisor under things to do. Awesome. And so let's see. Well, I think we'll have time for one more question um, from Carl. Nope. Let's see. Uh, we have a couple of votes on outside of the tour business. Uh, when do you think it will be practical for Americans to visit Europe? 
Best well, guess. it's 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 going to be incremental. It's it's going to be possible to visit Europe in the next couple of months, um, and it's but it's going to be certain countries, but it's not going to be all of the EU. And I just told my staff at our all staff meeting yesterday, I'm not if Europe's not all open, it's not open in my mind. I'm not going to be promoting Europe until it's all open, and that'll happen later this year, uh, I think. Who knows? But that's my my hunch. And at that point, independent travel will be very straightforward. Group travel, I think, would be reckless. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be very conservative about when I'm going to start getting 25 people on a bus and organizing all of that until I know it's going to be good and safe and reliable because I just don't want to put people through the emotional <laughs> disappointment and the heartbreak and all the turmoil of having them sign up, get excited, and then have to send their deposits back. I just don't want to do that again. So why not wait a few more months? I, I just don't want to as I said, I don't want to go to Europe until it's ready. And I just do Europe, but there's the whole world is, is sort of this situation. I shouldn't say the whole world is this way because there's a horrible gap just in the fairness of who gets a vaccine. And really, it's going to be a rich world thing for a couple of years. I mean, you could travel to Australia, New Zealand is a big bubble now. Uh, America and Europe will be a big safe bubble. Uh, but the, the rest of the world will yet to be vaccinated. And, you know, us privileged people will say, oh, yeah, we're all love your neighbor stuff, but only after we got our shots first, you know. So we thankfully, we have a government and I think a societal um, uh, belief that it is right for the United States to take the lead in helping the world get vaccinated. And as I promote, even in my, I just did a TV show about hunger and hope, lessons learned in Ethiopia and Guatemala. And the theme was helping out the rest of the world. <laughs> It's a love your neighbor thing. It's the right thing. It's an ethical thing, especially if you're as privileged as we are. But it's also a practical investment. Even if you could care less about love your neighbor, you don't want desperation south of the border. It's going to come and get you. It's not a place, nice place to raise your kids. And it's the same with the vaccine. So whether you're a love your neighbor kind of person or whether you're just a person that in the privacy of the voting booth is just worried about yourself, uh, we need to vaccinate the world. It's a smart, practical investment. And it's the same. Hey, there's a book called Travel. <laughs> I'm just reading a couple of paragraphs out of that, Alicia. <laughs> I'm looking at this. This is uh, one of the books that you donated to us for us to be able to oh, raffle nice. off. And I was like, looking at the title, I was like, huh, this is uh... <laughs> Yeah. And I, I bet the, the the new edition, and I believe that is the new edition, has a, a, a big new chapter, the biggest chapter in the book, I think, on Ethiopia and Guatemala and lessons we learned there. So that's the fun thing about travel. There's so much to get to know and to celebrate. And uh, and then you come home and, and you realize how richly blessed we are. And you really want to realize that uh, living in a beautiful community like Edmonds doesn't just happen. I, I joined a, a task force with a lot of people for the Chamber of Commerce. And first time I've done something like that. And I have such a respect for the people who sit through all these meetings and make all these things happen and come together and work out these complicated challenges. You know, you can't keep everybody happy and there's only so much money, but we can work together and uh, we can make sure that that Edmonds is uh, is a place that that is is a, a caring community and a, and a community that I would hope and pray does things together. Here, here. Awesome. Well, on that note, Thank you so much, Rick. We really, really appreciate your time. Oh, I mean, given your insight, it's huge. I hope it, I hope it was interesting. I hope that um, I, I just I'm feeling hopeful, and I'm I, all of us are just kind of like chomping at the bit. And uh, I've been getting more publicity in the in this last year from people that want to know what's the travel guy doing when he can't travel. <laughs> so I've been sitting here talking to a lot of uh, media around the country and. One thing I've been saying is, hey, I've actually enjoyed the opportunity to employ my traveler's mindset right here at home and have that positive sort of curiosity, that willingness to try new things and dust off old passions. And it's been a I'm I'm thankful it's been a pretty good year for me. But boy, I, me and my staff can hardly wait to get back at it. And I'm sure there's I, I like being on my perch here because I look out at Edmonds and it reminds me there's a lot of potential and a lot of pent up creativity and energy. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we can get some traction and do it safely, look out, it's going to be exciting. For sure. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. All right. Well, as I mentioned, uh, Rick generously donated a few of his books um, that we will be raffling off. I think this is the autographed one. So make sure to check your emails. We'll be raffling these awesome books off. 
Um, <clears throat> a couple announcements from the chamber. Uh, we do have uh, the Beat Bracket 5K race in the morning of July 4th um, that we'll definitely be able to do. So if you're interested in getting a, a fresh start to your 4th of July celebration, and that's a run or walk, um, you can register for that on the Edmonds Chamber website under events. And then also in July, July 26th, uh, which is a Monday, we're doing a charity golf scramble uh, at the White Horse Golf Course in Kingston, which will be a very fun day out. Uh, I keep wanting to say on the green, but I'm not a very sports person and Greg keeps telling me that's not what it's called, but out on the golf course. Uh, <laughs> uh, should be a really fun time. Uh, so whether or not you're a professional golfer or have never picked up a golf club before, it'll be a good time because it's not about how good you are. It's about getting out and having fun and raising money for the chamber so that we can continue to do events um, into the future. And, and don't worry, only the three people that are in your foursome will know how bad of a golfer you are. So just bring close friends. Uh, but it, it, we've done this event uh, many years in the past, and it's one that some of our members wanted us to bring back. So uh, happy to do that. And it's a easy social distanced type of event to, to proceed with, uh, regardless of where we are in our opening uh, through the state. So, Yeah. All right. Well, um, we have about 15 more minutes um, officially of this event. Um, so if... Jim, you can throw us all back into the general networking room. I think with the coffee bar is where we're hanging out today. Um, folks can get a few more minutes of mingling in and check out this awesome platform. We want to thank Jim with Contineo LLC um, for donating the use of iBreakthrough for this meeting today. It was very generous and we're very grateful. It's a really cool refreshing way to meet virtually um, where we can actually kind of sit and visit with people. So we're, we're really grateful for it. And it's, it's a really cool opportunity. And thank you to Salish Brewing and Savvy Thai who uh, worked with us for the people that wanted the lunch option to be able to pick up a lunch. Uh, just trying to normally our luncheons are in person and we have them at the different restaurants around Edmonds so that gives our members a chance to try the food if they've never been to that location and support a local business. So as uh, the state opens back up and we're able to, we're going to be bringing our luncheons back. And we always try to bring in some interesting uh, speakers through you know, the city and our county uh, to bring kind of educational components and, and talks to those. So keep an eye out for those as we get back. Also wanted to welcome Finney Phillip, uh, who is the new outreach pastor for North Sound Church. And uh, you know, the chamber, we're, we're here in office and have been here, you know, the office has kept going through this pandemic and we've done as much as we can to help educate and bring opportunities and grants to, to people's attention. Uh, but if there's anything that you've got a question on, uh, we either know who knows the answer or we can find it out for you. And that's, that's one of the things that we're here to, to do. So thank you again to Jim for the, this platform and we'll jump back into the, the general room. You can jump around and uh, chat with other people in the room. And if you didn't have your question answered, if Rick is still hanging out, maybe you can go do a quick ask. So thank you, Jim.